Welcome everybody to this uh, parents orientation for the Faculty of Engineering in the built environment. I'm going to share my screen with my presentation and I hope that you can confirm that you're in the right meeting. So welcome everybody. I'm just checking that you can hear me and that you can see me and that you can see my slides. Uh, just to let you know that um, the meeting attendees are on mute and the cameras are off. Um, at the end of the session, we're going to open for questions. So you, if you have anything you want to ask, you'll get a chance at the end. Um, at that point, uh, the technical help will unmute all the microphones you'll get a chance to ask questions and I ask that you please do that by raising the hand on the Teams function. So with that, let me get to my welcome. This is the Faculty of Engineering in the Built Environment and I'm the Dean, Professor Alison Lewis. Um, our shorthand for our faculty is EBE, Engineering in the Built Environment, and that's how you'll hear us referred to all over campus. I hope you're glad that you've chosen this faculty we believe in EBE that we are shaping the future. Even before COVID, we recognized that we needed to plan for a very different kind of future. The VC started something called the Futures Think Tank. And when COVID hit, that fast-tracked our process of really getting up to speed with the future fit faculty. And uh, synchronously as EBE professionals, this is exactly what we are trained for, finding innovative solutions to new challenges. So just to orientate you, we have six departments in the faculty. Um, the four classical engineering departments, civil, electrical, chemical and mechanical, as well as the two built environment departments, architecture, planning and geomatics and construction, economics and management. And you'll see under each little logo, I've specified what undergraduate degrees we offer. So civil offers the BSc civil. Um, architecture offers Bachelor of Architectural Studies as well as the BSc Geomatics. A CEM offers Construction Studies as well as Property Studies. Electrical offers three programs. That's Electrical Engineering, Electrical and Computer Engineering and Mechatronics. Chemical offers the chemical engineering degree and mechanical offers two programs. That's the classical mechanical engineering degree as well as the mechanical and mechatronic engineering degree. So if you don't see your degree on the slide, that means that you're in the wrong session because this faculty um, is offering these programs and this is what we're going to talk about today. Um, just to give you a picture of the faculty, we've got uh, about 4,500 students, of which 67% are undergrad, and of those, 14% are international. And you'll see by my pie chart there, um, very much um, undergrad focused. Uh, the yellow piece of the pie is the postgrad students, and the red are the PhD students. If you look at the class sizes for first year students, you'll see that the large classes are in mostly the engineering department. So electrical with the biggest first year class size of 207, uh, mechanical 165, chemical 119, and civil has been smaller in recent years uh, with 76. And then construction, economics and management, those two degrees together add up to 101. Geomatics is a small department, and then Architecture 89. So this gives you an idea of the size of the first year class. And probably the biggest jump is um, a much bigger class size than students are used to in the school environment. As you know, we've just been through two years of COVID. Um, the first year was pretty much survival mode and rapidly transitioning to being able to educate online. But in 2021, we developed a new model based on cohort teaching and homerooms. Um, and we thought this was really seizing the opportunity 
um, those opportunities created through freedom from the timetable and the central booking system, which is something we've been wanting to do for a while anyway. The teaching was mostly asynchronous transmission, and that freed up time for activity-based learning, project-based learning, tutorial-type activities, and practicals and demonstrations. So really, the engaged face-to-face -face stuff that is the exciting part of being an EBE. We also wanted to emphasize that cohort building is so important that you cannot do a degree sitting at home in your pajamas. Um, your relationships with your peers are absolutely vital. There's a huge amount of peer learning that goes on in these degrees. Our group work is really important for our EXO accreditation, which allows the degrees to be recognized internationally. And we also could do smaller groups and smaller classes to ensure that students got to know each other. COVID also allowed us a new kind of flexibility, which meant that we could creatively use space and time. Um, unblock progression, which means that if a student failed a single course, it no longer meant that they had to immediately go on to a five-year plan. We could fit um, those courses into the existing timetable. Students were encouraged to take on their own learning, and the block teaching freed up blocks of time. So we thought this was a really positive new model. And in 2022, we're going to continue much along the same vein. We believe we'll be mostly vaccinated, but not back to normal. And we're going to be running a hybrid model, which is online content supported by contact activities in homerooms and labs. We have dedicated venues across the faculty, which are just for our students. We're going to um, help students to do better time management. Um, there'll be more support from the Center for Higher Education Development. We have what's called super tutors in the faculty who help us to run these hybrid activities. And we're going to be insisting on some compulsory attendance, um, as well as incentives to make sure that students actually do come onto campus, because we believe that is so important. Um, you might want to ask, what about student support? Um, we're very proud of the level of student support we offer in the faculty. We have first year advisors for students. So every student has an academic who's allocated to them to be an advisor. And so they can go to this academic at any time and ask for academic advice. Aspect is our five year program. So students who want to spread their degree over five instead of four years have the option of doing a planned extended program. We also have every single department has at least one academic development lecturer whose main task is focused on pedagogy, education, educational research. And so that those people um, really look after academic development in the faculty. We also have something which is called boot camps. It's actually officially called tutored reassessment programs, but uh, basically, it means if a student fails a course, we offer a holiday program, which means they can come for one or two or sometimes three weeks and they get tutors who help them intensively re-study the material so they can redo the exam. We also have a tutor system which is run by postgraduates in the faculty. And this means that undergrad students can not only get to know students who are in the postgrad study areas, but also get a little bit of informal mentoring from them and get a picture of what it's like to be a senior student. And lastly, we run a mentor program in the faculty, which means every single first year student has a mentor um, and mentors have between two or three students to look after each. So it's quite close and those mentors are usually second year and above students and they are available to give advice about settling into campus, about struggles that students might be having, and we feel like they're good sort of almost peer to be a point of contact. The question around how can parents help? Very much. You can encourage your students to use the resources that are available to them. I often find that students uh, start falling behind because they don't use what we have on offer. Students must attend face-to-face -face sessions and tutorials on campus. We had relatively low attendance last year, and we can directly link low attendance to poor performance. So I cannot stress this strongly enough. 
Uh, they need to reach out for help when they need it and not wait until it's too late. Um, also really important to develop a network of like-minded students. So our academic development lecturers in their research have shown that students who are networked, students who have peer-to-peer -peer contact do better. They're less lonely, they're more motivated, and they're also more successful. So it's really important to get out of your shell, meet new people, and develop networks. It's also a big transition to take responsibility for their own education, and it's quite different from school in that way. So that's part of the, one of the ways that parents can really help is in that transition to being their own driver of their own education. And students need to get involved. There's so many things on offer on campus, and I really encourage students to grab the opportunities that are available. What about if students have got academic issues? What do they do? We have so many points of contact and support. First of all, every class has a class rep, and that person's job is to represent the concerns of the class, and that's a student in the class. So a very approachable point of contact. Obviously, the course conveners themselves. We have departmental staff who are responsible for undergraduate studies, and students will know who they are. They'll be identified. Um, heads of departments, undergraduate student council, and if none of those work, we also have the deputy dean for undergraduate studies. So we have a lot of points of contact and support for students to address academic issues. This is our online learning platform. Um, students probably already know what uh, Vula is all about, but all the coursework is there, all the lectures are recorded there, the tutorials are there, um, and students will very quickly find their way around Vula. So I'm going to end with um, a few FAQs, uh, which are the frequently asked questions, um, and then I'm going to hand over to the floor and see if you have any questions you'd like to ask me. So firstly, how will I know what, what, how they are doing academically? Um, we communicate with the students. They need to keep an eye on their UCT email address. And if you want to know how they're doing academically, you have to stay in touch with them, and they would need to inform you. Do they need vacation work? Yes. Um, the engineering and construction studies students do need to do vacation work during their holidays. It does vary between each department, but the students will be informed what they have to do. Um, there are staff members who help students to secure vacation work, but ultimately it is the student's responsibility, and we do ask that students make an effort. Often students have got links through family or friends or contacts, and it really helps us, especially with our large classes, if students can find their own back work. We also have a careers fair. We have companies who come and give talks on campus. So from the get-go, it's really important that students attend those. Um, all electrical degrees must do VAC training in first and third year. That's six weeks each. The mechanical degrees do four weeks in first year and six weeks in second year. The construction study students do four weeks in each of the first, second, and third years. Civils do six weeks in second year, and chemicals do four weeks in third year. Um, geomatics does two weeks in second year, and architecture does three weeks in second year. But you'll find all this information in the faculty handbook, um, and the students are told this. And then the question, what books do they need? Um, in the orientation pack, the first year students will get a book list. And once they've registered for the courses, they will know what books they need. The book list is also on our website, and so you can get the link there. Um, you'll also find there the specs for the laptops, as well as the architectural material that will be needed, the drawing kit, as well as the orientation program. And then lastly, can they change their course of study? They must register for the course they've been accepted into. And during the week of the 14th to the 18th of February, in other words, next week, they can go to the faculty office to apply to change. But it will depend on them meeting the requirements for the degree they wish to change to, and it depends on there being space available. So the last day they can do this is on the 18th of February. So they first need to go to the department they wish, wish to change, in other words, the 
faculty office and ask if there is a space and b do they meet the requirements of the course of study they wish to change into so i'll leave it there i'm very happy to take questions from the floor um please if you want to ask a question raise your hand um i see that roster and then c hambly nuss have both got questions so over to you Rasta. If you want to ask a question, you must unmute your mic on the on the Teams meeting. Okay. My son stands here with the CV of student number LNXSIT001. It's having a challenge concerning the, the study visa. He has been studying in UCT in Zimbabwe and yet he's residing in Swaziland. So now the whole process is taking long. So I'm really asking your patience uh, pertaining the registration because he's still this side yet he's supposed to be in, in UCT by now. So the father is now in Zimbabwe. We are expecting him by Friday to come with the, the clearance the police clearance from Zimbabwe, and that's when we will hand the application for the study visa. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for that. And I'm sorry to hear about the problems. There are some visa issues with our international students. And um, students who've got a problem with their visa need to contact the international office, which is arpa at uct.ac.za. And I wonder, Mary, if you can put that address into the chat. Um, students need to be here from the 14th of February, in other words, Monday next week. And they do have a small leeway until the 18th of February, in other words, during that first week. But after that, it's too late to join, as they would have missed out on too much. So um, if that happens, they can send an email to admissions at UCT to ask them to roll the application over to 2023. But it's really, really important that students come and arrive next week. Um, C. Humbly Nuss, over to you. Um, hi, good afternoon. Can you hear me? I can. Great. Um, I just wanted to ask, I mean, given the fact that most of the school children are going back full time, et cetera, and UCT is a public institution, um, I'm very surprised to hear from my son that he's not going to be going back. Um, you know, that the lectures, you know, he's gonna, not going to be on campus um, and that lectures will not be face-to-face -face and so forth. I, I'm just um, surprised by that because I really thought they would be back on campus full time. Um, you know, he's studying architecture and given the nature of the course, I thought that would be uh, needed, that he would be on campus. Yeah, he will be on campus. Um, we So there are two things. The one is the all restrictions have been mo removed for schools, but they have not been removed for universities. So we still have to comply with the Disaster Management Act, which still applies to us. And we have received, uh, applied for and received a concession. And the concession is that we can have lecture theatres where students are one metre apart as long as they wear KN95 masks. So we've marked up all our lecture theatres one metre apart and we're going to issue students with KN95 masks from the university and staff. But that still means that we cannot occupy our venues 100% like we used to. So that does constrain us. But it doesn't, that means we can't do 100%. But all our students will be on campus at least some of the time. And architecture are pretty much on campus most of the time. I mean, I was just this morning um, giving a session in architecture about the future of EBE and the design project and so on. So um, I think that your son might have misinformation, but we are definitely back. And the studios in architecture are definitely running. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Um, Tasha is next. 
Hi, um, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, I just want to find out quickly, my daughter is doing the me mechanical and mechatronic engineering, but she's not been able to register for the maths, I think it's maths 2, which is a requirement for the course. Is she a first year student? Yes, yeah, she is a first year student. Then she should be doing maths 1. She would only do maths 2 and second Only year. maths 1. Oh, okay. She was under the impression that she had to do two different. Yes. Alison? Yeah? Can I say? So she needs to email EB. Uh, I've put it in the in the chat for, for Sheraton, EBE reg at uct.ac.za. There was a problem with the second semester maths course, but they will sort it out for her and make sure that the numbers are increased so she can register. So please read, um, email that number straight away. Okay, will do. And then just one more question. Sorry, just with regards to the laptops, when do they need to have the laptops by? Because we had paid the money across to the university to purchase a laptop, but she needs to have an R5 or an R7. And obviously, they were only offered the R3 for, in, for the mechatronics. So we need to get that money back before we can buy a new laptop. Yeah, so let me just get back to the first question, which is on the maths, they need to do a first semester maths and a second semester maths. I think that you meant second semester. Yes. Oh, yeah, sorry, sorry, yes. Just to clarify that they don't do second year maths. But yes, okay, they yes, have issues with the, the automated registration. And then the laptop, I mean, my advice would be they need it when term starts. In other words, by Monday next week. Okay, but if we can't get the money back from the university, how do we do that? I'm not sure about that. Mary, can you answer that? Who who, who said that you needed the, the I-5? Because in, um, for the on the requirement, it says I-5 or I-7, um, I-3 if you can't get an I-5 or I-7. Yeah, because for the first two years, they're not really doing um, where they need the, the, those high computers. It's really in their third and fourth year when they, they're using um, bigger programs. So that yeah, but obviously we don't want to buy two different computers, so which is why we wanted the, the R7. But um, yeah, so that's fine. Don't worry, I'll sort that out. I'll just you, want you, to know you when can, I'll put, I'll, I'll put my email in the in the thing and you can email me and I'll follow up for you. Okay, super. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks for that question. I think that's it's also going to be very interesting for others as well. Um, let me just go back to my list. Uh, and uh, Roxy Ramdani, over to you. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, Alison, I think it was the same question as getting a laptop. Um, my daughter is there on a bursary, but they haven't sent her laptop as yet. And uh, you said that they're going to need them needed. Uh, they're going to start lessons on the 14th, which is Monday. So yeah, we have a bit of a challenge there. Is there any other way she uh, there is an access for her to use other laptops? The problem is, especially with, um, you know, everything being digital, the laptop is really important or some access to an ability to work online. So the very first thing that's going to happen is she will get access to the Vula sites, which are for all her courses. And then, of course, the lectures, the material, everything is online. So, yeah, unfortunately, a laptop is actually more and more becoming an absolutely core cool requirement. So if she doesn't have her own laptop, a borrowed one would do. Um, otherwise, some access to online is really important. Okay. Oh, thank you very much. I'll see what I can do. Okay. Thank you for that. Angela Rathbone. Good afternoon. Um, my question is, my silly son, um, as you said, accepted the wrong degree. And I know you explained how it's working. My question just was, is will the academic staff be on campus from next week, Monday, because at present he's trying to communicate in a, via email? The way to change the, the degree is to go to the faculty office. And the academics are not really going to be able to help. So academics are on campus, but they are 
busy doing registration at the moment. So I would advise that your son goes to the faculty office. Can and you tell me what degree this, he accepted? And so he, he, he was accepted for, he wants to do megatronics and he was accepted for both the electrical and computer science one and then the mechanical. And he chose the mechanical instead of the computer science one. He must email the faculty office. He has got a very, very good chance of changing. So it's a faculty it's office. A faculty he needs office. to do that. Um, Mary, won't you put the email address for changing yeah. in the chat as well? Thank and you. if I can say, if he wants to go onto campus, the faculty office is open with real bodies from half past eight until half past four every day. So if he's on campus, he can pop in there. And thank but you I so much, because according to him, there's nobody on campus. So that's why I asked the question. <laughs> the, the, campus. the campus is full. <laughs> I'm going to put the address in the chat. Thank you very much. <laughs> Has he been on to campus? Uh, who knows? Apparently not. <laughs> we are all here. I promise the EBE is popping. Everybody's here. No, thank you very much. Okay. Uh, next question comes from Melanie Momba. Over to you. Hi, Alison. Um, I have three questions. My son is a first year for civil, and he also has um issues with the second semester maths course registration Same so you, okay before. yeah there was an issue uh, because we're doing a, a more online registration there are teething problems with the system to put it lightly and as mary says they've now fixed that particular issue and mary i think he needs to try again or what he must go to he must EB, he must email EBE Reg the, the, the address on that I've put in the chat. Okay. And, was and then the second question is with regard to the textbooks. So he's a bursary holder. Um and I just wondered, do you have a specific procedure that they then um follow in terms of being able to to purchase their books? Being a bursary holder. Not as far as I know. If he if his bursary gives him funds for textbooks, then he would take those funds and go buy the textbooks like anybody else would. But Mary, I don't know if you know better. Yes, there's a book there's, there's a bookshop on campus, and he can take the bursary letter there to show that he's going to um, get the money. So and they will register that, and then he can purchase when they pay. Okay, because the, the funds are paid directly into the university account. They don't actually handle the bursary. They don't get money. Um, that's, the, they only pay directly to the university. That's fine. And then they, they will claim from, from his account. So he just needs okay. to go and register at the bookshop and find out what he needs to do. Perfect. And then the final question is, in grade 12, he received extra time um for the examinations so my question is he definitely is going to require the extra time for coursework and and examinations as well how do i go about applying for that so he needs to go to the disability office and he would need a letter from a doctor or the educational psychologist or whoever the professional is that obviously did it for you before and with that letter the disability office will then register him on their slate of students that need whatever it is, whether it's extra time or, you know, like uh, magnifying equipment or various things. And then every time there's an exam, he will get the extra time version. So your first port of call is disability office. Thank you. Does that, that will he also then get the extra time for a course assignment? Not likely. The extra time applies for timed um, activities. So like a test, you would get something like an extra 10 minutes for every hour or an exam, uh, extra 15 minutes for every hour. But for an assignment that you know, takes a week, um, yeah. there won't be extra time for that. Thank you. I'm covered. Um, let me answer the question about the bookshop. I really recommend, it's in the chat, and I know Mary's dealing with the chat, so I've got to keep my fingers out here, but I really recommend that you 
go onto the UCT website and there's an enormous campus map there and start to navigate, do the search function and navigate around the campus map. Because one of the skills that you need when you're on this campus is the ability to find out where things are. And uh, there are many rabbit warrens and little passages and funny buildings. So I, I recommend that you go onto the, the UCT website and look for campus map. But I'll, I'll stay out of the rest of the questions. Um, yeah, uh, next question. Uh, no more questions. Anything else? Mary, do you want to add anything that's been in the chat? Um, there's a lot of uh, chat about the scholarships. Um, I've said that they're waiting for registration to finish. We still have uh, uh, the, the first years that haven't registered before they can allocate them because they will see who the top students are and go down the list until there is no more money. Thanks, Mary. Uh, Rosemary Eager. You need to unmute if you're talking. Hi there, can you hear me? Excellent, go for awesome. it. Um, I just want to know the data allocated to students from the university. Um, what are the costs involved with that? Mary. Mm. I can tell you that last, during COVID, um, we had an agreement with the mobile providers that they would provide data for students as well as make our Vula site data free. So you can go onto Vula and watch lecture videos and so on without consuming any data. So I presume the Vula arrangement will continue, but I'm not sure if the other arrangement will continue. Because he just um, he had to sign up for it when he was registering, but there was no information as to the cost. And he got some data over the weekend, and I still don't know is his account being, um, is it going to go on his account or not? So mm. I, I don't know the answer, but I doubt it. If he gets data, it's probably part of this data bundle that students get. But Mary always knows more. Mary? Yes. Yes, so they're allocating. So on, on PeopleSoft, you have the option of opting in for data. So if they do need data, they opt in. If they don't, we ask them please to release it so we can help other students because it's very costly to the university. Okay. But then just to confirm, there's no cost to the student. No, no cost to the student. Thank you. I just have one more question. You mentioned something about the um, tutoring system and the boot camps where they help them in the um, vacation or sometime and to relearn and then they get to redo the exam. Is there a cost involved with that? It's the same as the course cost. So at UCT, we've got what's called course based fees. So when you get your account, every course the student takes will have a cost. But if you register for whatever, Triple E 1007, um, and you get a boot camp and a SAP, it's all part of the same cost. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, any other questions? I did see a question quite early on in the chat about the timing of exams. Um, another good reason to go on the UCT website is you can look at the academic calendar there and you can see exactly when the term starts and the term ends. You can also see when, I was going to say SWAT week, it's now called consolidation week, when those days are and exactly when the exams start and the exams end. So it's really important to have a look at the calendar because then you will know what the time expectations are and if you're wanting to go on holiday, you don't book your holiday during the exam period or during the term period or during consolidation week. Any other questions from parents?
Okay, Mary, do you want to add anything in closing? No, I think it's all good. I think you did covered everything. Thank you. Well, thank you very, very much, everybody. I hope that we've given you sufficient pointers to be able to find the answers to the questions you might have after the session. I definitely recommend the EBE website as a first port of call. The quick links drop down that Mary's created gives you almost absolutely everything you need. Um, and then the email addresses she's given you are the ones you need to mail to ask questions. And as she said, we are on campus. The faculty office is up to speed and been running at full blast since December. So please, um, let's answer your questions and get your, you sorted out. So thank you very, very much, everybody. Thanks for attending the session. And I really hope you have a happy time in this faculty.